Good morning, wise women. Barb Steven here. I'm opening this morning just quickly to tell you that one of our most wonderful ladies, Joan Weinstein, has passed away. She had been hospitalized and, as I understand it, um, had COVID. We're going to miss her. She was a wonderful, wonderful hostess, headed up solos, as you all well know, and did a fabulous job at it. We'll miss her. Um, and that's what I have to say also with regard to today. It will uplift your spirits. You're going to hear some stuff that I bet you didn't know about. Here's Margaret to tell you all about our speaker. We're so pleased to welcome Dr. Richard Crum here today. He's graciously agreed to talk with us about his work and highlight things from a book some of you may be familiar with, where he discussed the evolution of beauty, uh, which came out of his work as an ornithologist. Uh, he's the William Cope Professor of Ornithology at Yale. He's a well-accomplished person, head of curator of vertebrate zoology. I hope I'm getting this all right. <laughs> at Yale Peabody Museum of Natural History. He's a recipient of the MacArthur and the Guggenheim Fellowships. And he's a well-published author and researcher in ornithology. So turning it over to Dr. Crum, thank you so much for agreeing to speak with us today. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you. Uh, thanks first to Barb and, and to Margaret uh, for the introduction and for the warm welcome. It's, um, it's a, uh, a pleasure to be here today and uh, a distinct pleasure because uh, in fact, uh, when I was first intending to uh, speak or when I was first scheduled to speak was in last March. And it was the first event that was canceled due to the COVID pandemic. And that was just in early March. Um, of course, uh, now uh, that uh, very sobering and problematic event has affected every aspect of our life. So I just want to start with a recognition that it's a pleasure to be back uh, uh, to have renewed and to uh, and to just say that I hope you're all well and safe, and uh, and I know that uh, we're all experiencing uh, this uh, this together. Well, what I want to speak about today is an outgrowth of my work in ornithology, and really about the evolution of beauty. And when I mean beauty in this context, I don't mean beauty merely as we perceive it, but beauty as the birds perceive it, and in actually to this research is dedicated to the scientific idea that birds are beautiful because they're beautiful to themselves. Uh, and so there I've given you uh, in a nutshell, but uh, we're gonna elaborate on what that, what that means. Now, um, th this really is, um, let's see, I gotta go, oh, there we go. This really is a, a, a piece of bird watching science, right? And so it comes very much out of my own tradition and history as, as a bird watcher. And so um, when I saw my first Blackburnian warbler as a child, my, uh, my life uh, was somehow transformed, right? Uh, and uh, it, it made me who I am and uh, contributes to why I think I do the way I do scientifically. So I'm gonna start in that beginning um, uh, with um, uh, my beginning. And yes, that's, that's me, uh, Ricky Prum. I grew up in, uh, in Southern Vermont, uh, up Route 7 uh, in, uh, in, uh, in Manchester, Vermont. And this is me in, I think, uh, seventh, seventh or eighth grade, uh, school picture day. And uh, this is a uh, picture is uh, humorous in many reasons. But of course, uh, what I want to focus on, of course, is the glasses. Uh, the glasses are a critical part of my story because uh, when I got my first glasses in fourth grade at the age of 10, um, the world came into focus and suddenly within a few short months, really, I was a bird watcher. And what that meant was that I somehow knew that I would be pursuing a bird filled life, <laughs> that I would be studying birds. I didn't actually know what that would mean. Uh, and so uh, ultimately I pursued ornithology and evolutionary biology in, 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 for uh, my education. Uh, and as an undergrad, I actually discovered that evolution was the area of biology that was about what my bird watching had made so fascinating to me, which was the diversity of birds and their uh, 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 over the planet, over uh, uh, 
the habitats, et cetera. And so that led to uh, graduate work uh, in, here I am in Ecuador in the 80s, uh, recording bird songs in the high Andes. Uh, and ultimately, uh, I ended up at Yale. Here's my rather messy office where uh, science, uh, where all the science gets done, right? So um, uh, that's, that's how I got here, right? But indeed, a huge amount of my science has been dedicated to uh, study um, something that I didn't think of as a scientific topic, but which I've come to think of as a scientific topic, which is, as I said, the beauty of birds, right? And that's led to a whole uh, diversity of different kinds of folk, folks, focuses, so including the evolution of feathers, the evolution of these very colorful feathers, such as this uh, bird. And um, when we think about the beauty of birds, especially the beauties of themselves, we have some enormous challenges. Uh, birds are really so beautiful, right? Uh, and, and, and why is that? Well, to explore this challenge, I'm gonna start right out with, uh, with a, a video. This is um, a recording, a video recording by my former student, Ed Scholes, now at Cornell. And this is a bird of paradise, superb bird of paradise. It's a man, and he is going to, he's making a portrait display to a visiting female. She's about to land on his log. And as you'll see, during the display, he is transformed in a, in a, in a sort of unimaginable way. Right? And this really demonstrates the, um, uh, both the complexity and the uh, aesthetic um, intensity of, right? This guy is, uh, uh, um, uh, has these elaborate feathers with these photonic devices. Uh, we've also been studying those super black feathers that surround it, et cetera, right? But this shows the incredible complexity of those displays, right? Now, um, um, the science upon which this is based, right, is, or when we, when, we, when, we, when we look at scientific questions around such displays, we have to recognize that we're really dealing, or the subject of our study is the subjective experience of animals. What that means is the, there is an internal experience the animal is having uh, that affect biology that are not uh, you know, epiphenomena, but the subject of science itself. So uh, here we have an array of you know, relatively weird animals to us, right? Uh, the, the bat, which detects the world in a sonar, um, uh, with a, with a, a, a sonar, sonar pictures. Um, we have the mole, which has a very complex olfactory world, right? These are extraordinarily different from the ways in which we perceive the world. And if we were studying these organisms, we'd have to take that into account. In the, this fish in the lower left is a mormirid fish from Africa, and it actually senses the world with electrical fields. So it can detect sticks and rocks and other individual fish and prey items in the water, right? But they also sing electrical songs that vary in frequency and in tempo, uh, like music, but in an entirely different wave, electromagnetic waves. And these are waves that we can't even uh, imagine, right? Or imagine what it would be like to sense them. Right? So of course, when we look at the birds, uh, we can relate to them better because we communicate uh, uh, visually and acoustically much as the birds do. And so um, this, uh, I wanna emphasize the, sub the diversity of the kinds of subjective experiences, sensory experiences that animals have. But uh, uh, my own work is on one that we relate to quite well, which is the birds. Now, in order to make uh, this aesthetic or beauty, the subject of science, we need to make some uh, uh, definitions. So in my case, uh, I'm, a, I'm proposing that there's a special kind of evolutionary process that we call aesthetic evolution, uh, in which, uh, which is an emergent pro uh, consequence of three things. First, uh, sensory perception. The animal has to be able to perceive uh, the signal. Uh, some kind of cognitive evaluation, essentially equivalent to do I like that or not, and then choice. Uh, and if that choice takes place on a heritable substrate, you'll get the evolution of features of the animal body or the plant body that uh, evolve because of their aesthetic functions, right? So that includes the, the, the beautiful uh, plumages of the cock of the rock, the song of the wood thrush, the, the feathers on a blue jay, um, and also uh, these uh, baby birds, the evolution of cuteness is, a, is an aesthetic evolution topic. Uh, these are baby birds. 
very attractive to their parents, and flowers, flowers and fruits, which evolve uh, to attract the senses of pollinators and, and fruit-eating birds or frugivores, right? Now, to bring beauty back into the sciences, I also have to come up with a scientific definition. That beauty is not merely attraction, Beauty is a co-evolved attraction in which desire uh, for a, a preference and the form of the object that's desired have shaped one another over time. And it is mutuality between preference and traits, between the display uh, and preferences for it that drive the evolution of beauty. And actually, I think drive the aesthetic, uh, including in the human arts, right? So all of these details are not new to me. They actually trace back uh, uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in an interesting way to the work of Charles Darwin. Uh, and so Darwin, uh, after uh, the origin of species, had a, you know, some persistent problems. He, he had no theory of genetics. He had no theory of, um, of human uh, origins. And he had no uh, uh, hypothesis for what he called the, the origin of impracticable beauty. And as you see in this, in this, uh, in this uh, slide, um, uh, Darwin uh, wrote to uh, uh, American botanist Asa Gray after The Origin of Species, uh, where he said, the sight of a feather in a peacock's tail, whenever I gaze at it, makes me sick, <laughs> right? And I think you'll agree if you look at Darwin in this picture, he looks a little sick. Uh, and that's because Darwin was kind of a troubled guy. Uh, he took his intellectual problems very seriously. Uh, and mulled over them for years. So he was a slow scientist, but in many ways, very revolutionary because the thoughts he had were indeed revolutionary then, and they, and they still are. So beauty was a big problem for Darwin, and he came up with a novel solution. Instead of resting on his laurels as the most famous Victorian scientist uh, uh, of all, uh, he actually produced a second book, which he called um, um, The Descent of Man, which addressed two of these questions. Uh, origin of humans and the origin of beauty. And uh, in that, in that, uh, whoop, in that uh, uh, book, he, he proposed the mechanism of sexual selection, right? Which include uh, two different kinds of, 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 uh, of uh, possible um, uh, mechanisms. One was mating competition, uh, con uh, competition within one sex for control over the other sex, uh, usually male and usually giving rise to the uh, evolution of armaments or large size like antlers, right? Or large body size. The other was mate choice in which uh, members of one sex select their mates from the available uh, mates and uh, 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 available individuals. And that gives rise to the evolution of ornament, the evolution of ornament. So armament and ornament were at the core of of his theory of, of sexual selection. However, in his description of mate choice, which we'll focus on exclusively today, uh, Darwin used the ordinary language of human tastes and aesthetics. Now, modern workers often see this as kind of a uh, kind of Victorian oddity. This was just uh, Darwin being, um, uh, you know, going dotty, if you will, out there in downhouse in his elder years, right? But in fact, this is a core aspect of his science. So part of my job is to try to revive this Darwinian view, so uh, this aesthetic view. So he wrote of mate choice or preferences as an aesthetic faculty, as a taste for the beautiful, or as standards of beauty, right? Uh, these are all using the language of human arts or human aesthetic experience for animals, right? He also said the most refined beauty may serve as a sexual charm and for no other purpose. And by that he meant no other uh, practical purpose. So. Uh, uh, for example, not for adaptation by natural selection, right? So Darwin envisioned uh, mate choice as potentially very different from his other hypothesis uh, of, uh, mechanism, uh, hypothesized mechanism, which was natural selection, right? So Darwin's theory of that male-male competition structured the natural world uh, was so obviously true to Victorian uh, culture that it uh, was immediately adopted. But Darwin's theory that mate choice, in particular female mate choice, was a force in nature, was a big loser, uh, basically. Uh, and, and some of those responses to Darwin's ideas were explicitly misogynistic right at the time. And, um, but one of his main uh, antagonists in uh, the area of mate choice was actually the co-discoverer of uh, adaptation by natural selection, Alfred Russell Wallace. Uh, and Wallace, uh, 
critiques uh, Darwin's idea of made choice relentlessly, but in general um, was unable to lay a glove, you might say. He was unable to, to really uh, take it apart. But uh, when he admitted that it could happen in cases like the peacock, uh, he made some very interesting statements. So here he said in a, in a uh, section of a book called uh, Natural Selection Neutralizing uh, Sexual Selection, he said, the only way in which we can account for the observed facts that is, you know, beauty like the peacock's tail, is by supposing that color and ornament are strictly correlated with health, vigor, and general fitness to survive. So here, Wallace proposes that Darwin's theory of mate choice only makes sense if it's a kind of adaptive force. That is, that, that beauty is only about betterment. And what that means is that beauty in the world is a kind of utility, uh, a kind of way of getting better, and that this would take all of Darwin's view on, uh, you know, the, the passion uh, and aesthetic uh, um, uh, taste and delight and charm and turn them into practical purposes, vigor, health, and general survival. And this is the origin of the very modern idea, what I call the biomatch.com profile, where essentially uh, beauty is an advertisement for honest information about the quality of individuals that, uh, 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 that a mate might prefer. Now in uh, Darwin and Wallace debated this until Darwin's death in 1883. Uh, and Darwin never gave an inch, uh, but Wallace uh, continued. And Wallace actually lived uh, all the way to the uh, dawn of the first world war. So Darwin had, or Wallace had a predominant impact on how science developed. Now in a book that Darwin, uh, Wallace wrote called Darwinism, uh, he proposes that, um, or he describes that even in rejecting that phase of sexual selection depending on female choice, I insist upon the greater efficacy of natural selection. This is the preeminently Darwinian doctrine. And therefore I claim for my book, the position of being the advocate of pure Darwinism. So here, Darwin has been dead for only six years, and Wallace is claiming to be more Darwinian than Darwin. Well, it's uh, 140 odd years later, and I'm still pissed. And I hope that you will be too, uh, because what happened in history is that we have been denied the actual complexity of understanding uh, Darwin's work, mostly as a result of this kind of Wallacean view, right? Um, so what I think happened is that uh, Wallace uh, lost the battle over credit for the discovery of natural selection, right? Uh, and justly so. Darwin had been working on the idea for decades, right? But he won the war over what evolutionary biology would become in the 20th century, which was an overwhelmingly adaptationist uh, enterprise. That is one dedicated to the greater efficacy of natural selection and also to the insistence on it, right? And in fact, uh, this flavor of this quote characterizes lots of scientific reviews to my recent book. People still uh, believe in, in this, Wallacean, uh, this Wallacean view, right? Um, so, in order to drive this home, I'm going to compare, give you a, uh, an analogy that you can describe at the breakfast table or to your friends at a socially distanced bridge game, hopefully over the web, uh, uh, or uh, over your next Zoom call. But um, I'm going to compare the value of beauty to the value of money. Where does value arise and how does it arise as a natural process, right? Well, we know that under the gold standard, the value of money exists because of the gold. The value of the dollar is not in the dollar, it's in the gold. And so every dollar has value because it stands in lieu of a tiny piece of gold in Fort Knox, right? <laughs> and so uh, in that case, um, the value is extrinsic. It's outside of the money and the money is a placeholder for extrinsic value. Now we know that all, all uh, currencies from dollars to Bitcoin have abandoned the gold standard. So where does the value of money come from now, like all money? Well, it's what Samuelson, a famous uh, economist, described as a social contrivance. It arises merely because uh, we all agree that it's practical that money should have value to further our economy, 
right? And, and so in this case, the value of the dollar is intrinsic. We create it through our investment in faith and in the money, right? So as a comparison, my uh, scientific colleagues are on the gold standard, the Wallaceans, right? They believe that the value of the peacock's tail, that beauty is valuable because it stands in lieu of other things. Those other things are uh, good genes, um, uh, protection from sexually transmitted diseases or better territory, right? Material benefits, real benefits, right? And uh, they're on the evolutionary gold standard. But uh, uh, the Darwinians, and, and I'm advocating, um, that we should abandon the gold standard in science and that beauty is for its own sake, that the value of beauty is, to the peacock is that it's attractive and that that drives in and of itself, that desire drives the... Uh, the evolution and diversity of beauty in the natural world. Well, uh, in a scientific framework, I call or summarize this argument as beauty happens. <laughs> what that means is that there's um, a sensory perception, uh, some kind of cognitive evaluation, do I like it or not, and some opportunity for choice, then beauty will evolve in the natural world. It is independent of uh, adaptation by natural selection and a force in nature. Now, I want to show a few examples of extreme beauty to side of uh, um, how beauty happens uh, to, to, to drive this home. And this one is the Argus pheasant. This is a, a bird that's found mostly in, um, in uh, Southeast Asia, Indonesia, uh, and outlying islands. Uh, this is actually taken in a zoo. And the pheasant, uh, to begin with, the male is about six feet long. Uh, but he's uh, mostly drab brown. And there's the female. He's going to be uh, displaying to the female in hopes uh, of encouraging her to mate. And you'll see in a moment that he's actually, again, like the bird of paradise, his display is characterized by a transformation in his form. What he's done there is open up his wings to create a kind of blown out umbrella shape, a hemisphere that is suspended uh, along the side of the female. And that on each of those long wing feathers is arrayed a whole series of spheres. These spheres are not real, they're, they're color patterns, pigmentation patterns. But they create this uh, sort of trompe d'oeil, this, this appearance of, of 300 or so golden balls suspended in the air. And notice that they're, um, they're light on the top and darker on the bottom, uh, in the same way that you can tell by the highlights uh, uh, shining on, off my head or off my nose that I'm three-dimensional. This is a optical illusion created by the display. Now, you can watch this, uh, this tape a lot longer, but I'm gonna proceed. Uh, here is an image of those feathers themselves. These are, you can see that little white highlight uh, at the top of, or at the, uh, on the upper side of those uh, circles which gives you the impression like, uh, like the shine off an apple, that it's a three-dimensional object, right? Uh, and then further, if we look at the entire feather, we can see that there's an additional optical illusion. If you uh, look at the feather just uh, directly, you'll see that this, the size of the spheres uh, scales with the size of the feather. As the feather gets bigger, the, the, the golden balls get bigger. Uh, but if you look at it from the perspective of the female, that is foreshortened, uh, where the bottom of the feather is nearer to the female's eye, you will see that it's these, these balls all converge on the same size. So we have two levels of optical illusion, one that is the three-dimensionality, and the other is the uniformity in size. And both of them arise without providing any information about extrinsic uh, possibility. Right, so uh, like, is this die actually better? You don't need to be better to be more, you know, uh, illusory in this three-dimensional way, right? And so uh, this kind of optical illusion is clearly about the aesthetic impact, the impact on the subjective experience of the animals and has nothing whatever to do with information about quality, right? So this is an extreme, aesthetically extreme bird that I think Wallace and Wallace's theory uh, and the one that's prevalent in, uh, in biology today uh, uh, would have trouble understanding. Now, this is the song of, uh, uh, of another bird. This is the club-winged mannequin, which I spent um, 
a number of years, or it's a member of a family that I have studied for many years. This male is, uh, is singing uh, to attract mates in, a, in an arena. Uh, the females will, like in Birds of Paradise, the females will visit, uh, select a mate, and then raise all the young in their own. So there's very strong sexual selection or mate choice operating on, on the song. What's fascinating here is that this song, this pick, pick, wing, is actually not a vocal song. It's made by his wing feathers. So this is a bird that's singing with his wings. Wow, uh, this uh, video is actually the work of Kim Boswick, also now at Cornell, married to Ed Scholes uh, at Cornell, and they're met in my lab as grad students at the University of Kansas before I came to Yale. But um, uh, uh, what Kim showed in her dissertation was how that sound was produced. And this is a high-speed video showing that the feathers are oscillating over the back. They've been snapped into place and then they're, they're, they're uh, 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 you know, oscillating or vibrating, uh, but a very, uh, at only one, only uh, 100 cycles per second. But the frequency of the sound is uh, 1400 cycles per second. So a lot uh, had to, uh, we needed a frequency multiplier. So what, uh, what, what Kim discovered was how that feather, how that sound is made is a result of it, uh, the interaction of these two feathers. This is uh, what they call stridulation. Uh, and this, the, the blade on this fixed, sixth, fifth secondary uh, feather um, rubs onto the bumps on the sixth secondary causing a mechanical um, um, stimulus like bowing a violin or running your finger over a comb or uh, that, that creates the sound. So here we can see as, uh, uh, as the feathers oscillate from in to out, the, these blades rub on that feather, stimulating that feather or initiating that sound. That's amazing. This is the only stridulating bird. So that shows that beauty can be very novel. But in subsequent work, Kim showed uh, uh, or studied a very profound question. She asked, mm -hmm. is beauty only skin deep? And she was able to show that no, beauty is not only skin deep. In order to make these beautiful songs, the, uh, the skeleton of the, of the mannequin has been transformed. In particular, the wing bones. In order to hold on to those feathers to make that sound, they have been transformed. And here's a comparison of the ulna, that's the trailing wing bone, of other mannequins, other closer related species on the left. And then this very large ulna is the ulna of the male club wing mannequin. Uh, so in order to make those sounds, they had to have a, an enormous investment in wing bones, right? And you can see that the wing bones of the male mannequin, of this club wing, the radius, uh, ulna and humerus are all solid, like ivory. This is extraordinarily and extraordinarily expensive. Uh, but it could be a, 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 a concluded to be a, what we call a handicap, kind of the cost of doing business, uh, what it takes to be beautiful. But I wanted to explore that further. So I asked the question, what about female club wing mannequins? Uh, what are their wings like? And it turns out to make a long story short that the wings of the club wing mannequin are almost as bizarre as the wing bones of the male, but she will never sing a song. So she is paying some of the costs of making these extraordinary wing bones uh, but is never actually using them for anything, right? Why does that arise? Well, uh, I call it the evolution of decadence, <laughs> right? And that's because it's a process that makes everybody worse. So let's imagine when the female is selecting the male she prefers, uh, he sings the beautiful song that she likes. Her male offspring will inherit the capacity to sing those beautiful songs, which of course will mean having weird wing bones, right? However, in birds, the bones begin their development in the egg before the embryo has become either male or female. And what that means is that the, there's no possibility to get the male wing bones to be distinct without changing the female wing bones. So the female wing bones are also being transformed. So by selecting for these songs she's having, uh, that she likes, she's also having daughters that have worse wing bones who are made worse at foraging, at surviving, et cetera, right? So this is, uh, I call this decadence because in the case female mate choice has made everybody in the population worse, right? Um, and uh, at, at some point, one, uh, um, um, after the book came out, one uh, um, journalist was asking me, you seem kind of delighted at that prospect. And I said, well, maybe a little bit, but 
the reason why this is important is because, in fact, when natural selection and sexual selection are working in opposite directions, when sexual selection make people make all these organisms less able to survive, that's when you realize that Darwin was brilliant in understanding that these are different evolutionary forces. And that's a lesson I'm still trying to bring uh, to the scientific community today. Well, I hope I've convinced you that there's an aesthetic element in, 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 in evolutionary biology, that uh, birds uh, are beautiful to themselves, and that by pursuing this beauty, it gives rise to a whole diversity of things that we also think are beautiful. I call this aesthetic agency. That means that the organisms themselves have choices that allow them that they have preferences that they, pref that they pursue, and that, that gives rise to the evolution of beauty itself. But I'm going to uh, uh, connect this, try to connect this with some topics that I think are really interesting, which is that since we study agency, we were very well prepared to understand um, what happens when agency is infringed. And that uh, raises the very problematic but fascinating topic of duck sex. Um, and so uh, a word out that this is uh, uh, what, what, uh, what they would call in the university today a trigger warning. This is actually uh, some... Um, uh, duck sex is deeply problematic and, uh, and troublesome, and yet uh, instructive in a really important way, which is why I share it with you. Now, um, uh, ducks, most ducks uh, have a, or ducks have a traditional breeding system that you would, un that people broadly appreciate. Females, like this mallard, uh, choose males, uh, their mates, based on their displays and their beauty. And they have preferences for those. So that includes preferences for the green head and the quack, 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 and all the displays they do. But uh, as they approach the breeding season, there are a number of ducks in the population, males, that are unmated. And they pursue uh, uh, females for forced copulations and try to get uh, some breeding opportunities. Right? Uh, this is essentially the equivalent of rape in the animal world, and it uh, is really uh, harmful and problematic for the ducks. The female ducks will um, uh, fight them, they will uh, attempt to flee, uh, and in some cases they're injured or even killed in the process. So this is a really uh, important topic for female ducks. Now, um, this work I ended up studying was with, done by Patty Brennan, who wanted to study uh, the evolution of uh, the genitalia of ducks. And when, I, uh, when she first came to my lab, I thought, well, I've never worked on that end of the bird before. I'm sure I'll learn a lot. Uh, but in fact, what I learned from Patty through this research transformed my view of evolutionary biology in a way that I never experienced. That's what I want to share. So um, this uh, forced copulation uh, in ducks is made possible by the fact that ducks have uh, a penis. The penis is actually involved in the common ancestors <clears throat> of birds and, or, uh, sorry, <clears throat> and mammals uh, and is retained uh, in that common ancestor. Now it's been lost in most birds, but still retained in ducks, as you can see in this whistling duck uh, uh, male. Right now, the, the the penis of ducks is extraordinary in many ways, and one of the ways it's extraordinary is in its size. Some species of ducks have really long penises. <clears throat> this is the Argentine lake duck, which is the Guinness World Book record holder for the longest penis. It has a penis that's longer than its body. Right, so uh, it took Patty, this woman ornithologist, to come to my lab to say, uh, "What's with that? What what is going on with that uh, structure in the penis?" <clears throat> now what? Uh, the other features of the penis of ducks that are really unusual is the fact that it's a uh, lymphatic erection instead of blood vascular. It has um, uh, 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 an open groove or sulcus instead of an enclosed urethra. Uh, and it's clock, uh, counterclockwise coiled. And it comes in smooth, uh, ribbed, toothy, and even thorny varieties, which are part of the, uh, their coercive force. Now, the next video... Uh, well, in science, we always aim to change lives, right? Uh, that's our business. But uh, this next video will change your life. Uh, it, and uh, so if you don't want to have your life changed, you should divert your attentions because you can't forget this. This is a, a slow speed uh, or a video of uh, how a duck penis uh, erects that's informed how uh, females have evolved in response to forced copulation. It was taken at a duck farm in... Uh, in, uh, in California with uh, Patty Brennan uh, and myself.
So this, uh, the, the male's on top and there's the female below. Uh, and you can see the penis unfurls itself. This all happens in a third of a second. So a very short amount of time. And you can see that the sulcus works just fine. Thank you. Now, what I want to also point out is that we're using the metric side of the ruler, which means that this is actually science in case any of you were concerned. Uh, so what happens to that structure, which is erecting instantaneously into the female reproductive tract? Well, what Patty discovered is that in species that have a very low frequency of forced copulation, the penis uh, uh, on the left here is small and the vagina of the female is very simple. But in species where there's lots of forced copulation, the penis evolves to be much larger and the vagina evolves these convoluted changes in shape. What are those changes? Well, the first is a series of blind uh, cul-de-sacs off the side of the main passage uh, uh, to where the, uh, where the eggs are produced, right? And then upstream of that are a series of clockwise spirals. Recall that this penis is actually counterclockwise shaped. So this is literally an anti-screw device. This is a, a mechanical challenge that excludes the penis during forced copulation. Uh, and what Patty was able to show is that the evolution of penis size is correlated with the evolution of uh, a vaginal complexity. What that means is that females have evolved to prevent uh, fertilization during forced copulations. We were able to show that in uh, a series of experiments using uh, these uh, glass tubes. And, and in one of the favorite passages in the book is to describe a going to the Yale glass blowing shop in the physics department or in the chemistry department at Yale and uh, say, telling them that we wanted to create uh, um, artificial vaginas for ducks. Uh, and, uh, uh, but, but we did. So we have um, uh, a, a, a straight tube and a tube that's counterclockwise coiled in the same form as the, as the duck penis and a, 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 a clockwise tube and a cul-de-sac. And what we, were, uh, what we were able to show is that the penis of ducks uh, inverts at the same speed and the same frequency in air uh, in these tubes, but was blocked 80% of the time uh, in, in, in the female-like structures. So what does that mean? This means that uh, freedom of choice matters to ducks. That, that sexual autonomy is not just an idea that was invented by suffragettes and feminists in uh, the 19th and 20th centuries, but is actually a phenomenon that evolves in social sexual species like, like ducks, right? Uh, that there is something it is like to have freedom and there, is, there are evolutionary consequences when it is infringed. How does this evolve? Well, when the female chooses the male she prefers, uh, then she, her offspring will inherit the quack, quack, quack and the green head that she prefers. Uh, and that's the indirect benefit of mate choice that drives aesthetic evolution. But when she's forcibly fertilized uh, by a male that she does not prefer, her offspring are less likely to, in, to inherit the traits that she and other females have evolved to prefer. What that means is that there's an indirect cost, a genetic cost, in, in terms of, uh, of, of sexual coercion, sexual violence in this case, right? And so uh, anything the female could do to prevent that from happening will evolve. So by evolving more uh, complex vaginal structures, the female is able to advance her own capacity to control who is the father of her offspring, right? Um, so I consider this to be kind of a deeply feminist discovery in evolutionary biology, which was uh, very surprising uh, because um, you never expect as an ornithologist that somehow you'll uh, encounter uh, something with such uh, social and political relevance. But indeed, I actually was able to explore that in a piece in The New Yorker uh, called Duck Sex and the Patriarchy, which uh, if you uh, get online, you can, you can, you can still find. Um, now, um, the, the, the tragedy of ducks, of course, is that there's an arms race. Uh, more vaginal complexity, more uh, larger penises, da, 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 and it keeps going on and on. It's not really an arms race because the female is returning to parity, to freedom of choice, and the males are really evolving instruments of control. But there are other birds that show a different path in this way, and, that, and, and they are the bowerbirds. Bowerbirds are the best example. 
Now, the bower birds are also one of these aesthetically extreme groups. The female does all the nesting and the males merely display. And so the female visits the various males and then chooses her mate. Uh, in this case, the males build these incredible structures uh, called a bower. The bower is not a nest. It's better thought of as a seduction theater <laughs> with, with one seat, right? And so here is uh, what we call an avenue bower. And this satin bower bird has made this bower out of sticks um, and he ornaments it with a bunch of blue objects. You can see like blue feathers, but also blue trash. And the Australians can't help but put out blue trash for these birds. Oh, I, I didn't say, these live in Australia and, and New Guinea only. So um, the, the, the bower is, uh, is aesthetic, it's beautiful, it has architecture, and yet it also has this other function. Now, here is a, a bower created by a great bower bird, uh, also an avenue bower, so it has these uh, two walls, and that is the male, but he's sitting in the place where the female will sit when she visits. Now, this guy is interesting because in this species, they collect white objects like bones or very bleached sticks, of which there's a lot in the dry areas in, in, uh, in, uh, in Australia. But this guy is on the west coast of Australia, just a few kilometers from the ocean. And on the ocean is a cliff, and in that cliff is a, is a fossil stratum. Uh, and in those fossils are uh, clams. And so this is a pile of fossil clam shells, right? So um, this is kind of a paleontological bowerbird. He's a curating his own private museum of, 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 um, of, of, of aesthetic objects, in this case, you know, fossil shells. So as a curator myself, I kind of relate to this guy. So when he's up in the top of his tree in the morning singing to attract female visitors, as he does, He's actually singing, do you want to come over and see my fossil collection, right? So, so what he does in his display, when the female visits, uh, she will sit right or stand right in the bower as he is. And the male will be out front as in this position, right? And he does a series of displays and shows the objects. And now we see this additional function to the bower. If the male decides he wants to copulate and he's standing out front, he has to go back around the walls of the bower to mount the female from behind. But if she is not ready, if she is not sure this is the right guy, then she can pop out the front. So the bower is aesthetic, it's beautiful, it has architecture, but it also protects the female from sexual coercion. It creates a circumstance in which the female can get intimately close, literally, inches away from this male. She can see all of his stuff, all of his cool materials, and he has to display for as long as she likes. And she's still preserving her capacity to decide who is gonna be the father of her children. This is uh, using, she has used her mate choice to transform maleness in a way that furthers her own sexual autonomy. The males build the bowers. Why do the males build the bowers? Because the females like them. Right? Why do the females like them? Well, they are beautiful, but also they protect them. They protect them from coercion, from essentially the equivalent of something like date rape or sexual coercion. Right? So this, uh, uh, there's actually other kinds of architecture. This is a maypole bower where the male and the female sit on either sides of this pole. And when the male moves around, the female moves around. So she keeps the pole between her and the male in order to protect herself until she decides that this is the right male, right? Now, um, what do female bowerbirds do with their freedom? Having earned their autonomy by transforming maleness in a way that allows them freedom of choice, what do they choose? Well, they choose beauty. And what that means is that we're in a position to say that freedom of choice uh, begets beauty in nature. That sexual autonomy, autonomy uh, is a key to the creation of the beautiful in the world. And, and that is a scientific statement, right? And that's the kind of scientific statement that I think is still revolutionary and that is still resonating um, or with, uh, you know, from Darwin's work until today. Um, now, there is uh, uh, other sorts of extreme examples of this. This is an example of another mannequin. The, these are uh, six, soon to be seven, unrelated males, all displaying together. Right? 
on, on, on this log, on this street. And, and over here on the left, you can see the female. She's observing these, all these males together, right? What could possibly be going on? Well, this is a team of males that are displaying. And when the alpha male or the dominant male uh, gives a signal, all these other males will leave and only the female will be mated by that one male. So all these males are helping one other male uh, to attract mates. Uh, and they're not, they hope to inherit the perch, but essentially this is a kind of, uh, of, of reproductive cooperation. I call it bromance before romance. <laughs> now, other science has shown that the best predictor of, of male success in this group is not um, how um, uh, dominant or aggressive or uh, 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 socially in charge you are. It's how many friends you have. Right, so female choice for aesthetics, something they prefer, uh, say group display, has led to a transformation of maleness into a cooperative form to allow males to cooperate. And why? Because females enjoy it, right? And uh, this is a kind of extreme form of aesthetic um, exploration of uh, of uh, their um, uh, of their autonomy, of their freedom. So uh, this aesthetic uh, evolutionary phenomenon that I've explored in bird uh, mating displays is actually found much more broadly in nature. It includes the uh, flowers, uh, which are co-evolving with uh, pollinators or fruits in their frugivores. Fruits are beautiful uh, because they want to be eaten. And then lastly, it includes aposematic or warning colorations like monarchs or this this uh, monarch butterflies, which are toxic, or this venomous snake, right? So nature doesn't just do beauty, it can do uh, 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 you know, revulsion, uh, horror, genres of horror as well. This uh, coral snake to the birds is like a genre of horror, right? So uh, uh, there's a broader uh, way in which aesthetic evolution uh, describes uh, nature, uh, or it, it, it has a role in, in, in the explanation of, of nature and its diversity. Okay, well, um, that was a pleasure. Uh, I'll leave it there and, and um, uh, let you know that if you're interested, um, uh, The Evolution of Beauty is now out in, in, uh, in uh, hardback and paperback. And in addition, in uh, uh, nine other languages, uh, soon to be 13. So uh, if you ha have friends that's, uh, that like to read in Italian, or Swedish, or Japanese, or Korean, or, or etc. You can find uh, versions for them. Uh, so thank you very much. I, I'll be happy to answer questions, which I guess are going to come from Margaret. You're you're still muted, Margaret. I said, didn't press the button hard enough. How's that? It's better now. Great. Can you hear me now? Okay, wonderful. Well, thank you so much. That was so wonderful. interesting. Really, I, I'm sure things none of us expected to hear. Um, well, that's my job. Yeah, okay, very, very informative. Uh, our first question asks about the uh, relevance for humans, that, um, you know, the aesthetic decadence that you described. Are there examples in uh, human beings that would be similar, or, or would you say that's different? Well, um, the, uh, the, the last third of my book is actually about the evolution of human sexuality and humans. And so I have a lot of thoughts on that. Uh, the first one is that to talk about human sexuality responsibly uh, takes a lot of time. <laughs> yeah. right? So that's why I can't, I, so I hesitate to go quickly in to this, but, um, uh, but since you ask, I, I, I'll, I'll say a few things. One, I think uh, human sexuality is very complicated because all the kinds of evolutionary mechanisms are present. You have uh, male choice and female choice. You have male-male competition and female-female competition. You have sexual coercion by males and females. And then on top of that, you have culture in which aspects of uh, individual sexuality are, are learned or are or, or shaped by, um, by the culture in which we grow up, right? So, so all that, means that you know it's very complicated so it's not a pr surprising that people might miss uh, communicate in this important topic um but what i what i would say a few things one it's overwhelmingly um aesthetic right this wallacean idea of honest in uh, signals has been communicated 
uh, relentlessly in uh, the popular literature and in an area of science called evolutionary psychology. Um, to the point where I think young people, especially young women, grow up thinking that every difference about them, every slight deviation from symmetry or, or the ideal is an indication of their inner um, uh, you know, uh, uh, genetic disorder, right? And there's this idea is such a bad science, it's been rejected in, in, in birds, and it certainly is true. So what I hope is that this aesthetic view helps us create, a, you know, a, a, well, it's a little grandiose. When you write a book, you hope to change the world, but I would love to change the world in this way, which is that young people grow up thinking that their job of becoming an adult is really about becoming a, a sexual subject, right? To understand who they are and what it is they like and prefer, and not a sexual object, something that others, to attract others, the attention of others, right? And I think we would have a much uh, safer world if that were the case. Um, the uh, other thing to note is that the, the science of Wallace and adaptation cannot describe sexual pleasure and its origin. But um, uh, so there's a chapter in the book about the evolution of orgasm, uh, in particular female orgasm, which I think everyone will find fascinating, especially the wise women uh, of, of Fairfield County. And so, uh, so I recommend that to your attention. So that, that's, where, that's where I'll leave that. Thank you very much. We have a similar question um, about the applicability of, of your study to other mammals, you know, other than humans. Uh, would you see that as similar if we were to look at uh, a sample of um, Well, I'm an ornithologist, so, so I, I, I don't apologize for my bird-centric, but you're right, there's a good, uh, my bird-centric worldview, but there's a very uh, interesting uh, issue of like how broadly does this apply. Um, in, 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 in most mammals, uh, females are doing an overwhelmingly large part of the, of the investment, right? And they do have some uh, extensive, in many species, extensive choices. Um, um, in particular, bats uh, have a lot of mate choice, right? Uh, because bats fly around like birds. Um, but in, in many cases, uh, there isn't a lot of choice. Uh, so if you think about um, um, seals or, or uh, uh, you know, uh, deer and bison with antlers, uh, you know, there's a, there are uh, lots of circumstances in which there's not mate choice. Uh, and this, uh, you know, prevents sexual selection or, or mate choice from uh, giving rise to, to beauty. Um, one thing that we can say is that uh, probably a lot of mammalian beauty is olfactory, right? It's about chemicals. It's about smell. Uh, and, of course, we know that uh, most commercial pr uh, perfumes of any note include actually extracts of mammals, right? Whether it's mink or musk or these, all these things. Uh, so we retain a little bit of this, but we don't have enough. And so we don't really understand uh, olfaction very well. And that makes it hard for us to study. So I think that the beauty of mammals is understudied. Uh, and um, if we were, had the olfactory capacity of that mole that I showed, uh, our science would be based entirely on olfaction and we wouldn't know anything about blue, green, red, or whatever. Because uh, those, those mammals are also colorblind for the most part. Yeah, our next question concerns the relationship between your work, or this work anyway, I'm sure you have a lot of other work as well, but uh, you're looking at behavior for, for birds. And when we talk to hobbyists, you know, bird watchers, birders, uh, at least the ones that uh, I've known, they talk more about looking at the physical characteristics, you know, the coloring, the markings, the sound, and, and so on, um, or the number of different species that they've been able to observe. We don't typically hear them talk about anything behavioral. Uh, is that changing at all, or do you, do you well, think that... Well, you know, uh, I, I, I'm not going to criticize those people because I'm, I'm one of them too. <laughs> it's yeah. not, I love to see a new bird, a rare bird, you know, the first bird of the year, the last bird of the season, uh, a new bird from my feeder on the back, in my backyard, right? So I, I appreciate that. So, so this work is totally compatible with that. But what I really would uh, hope happens, and it certainly affects, my science certainly affects my bird watching is uh, what I described as kind of deep birding, <laughs> right? Where when you're watching the bird, you're actually <clears> thinking <throat> about its evolutionary history, uh, how it got that way, 
uh, how it differs from its relatives, et cetera. So, so I, I think this okay. can be a real augment to, um, to, our, uh, to our experience of birds in the wild. Um, our next question refers to individual differences. And when we talk about human behavior, we talk so much about all the differences among us. Um, is that just our human-centric way of looking at the world, or do you think birds have a wide range of differences in terms of things like attraction, how they look at beauty, and so on, or is it more uniform? Yeah, well, you know, um, uh there are aspects of uh, human biology that make us a lot more variable, right? One is culture, the fact that we learn our preferences and that we're shaped by our cultures. But it turns out that there's birds that have culture uh, that are equivalent. So the birds, a uh, lot of birds learn their songs from other members of their own species. So that means that the birds in Boston, New York and Chicago sound differently from each other for the same exact reasons that the people do. And, and, it's, and it's not about, you know, the baked beans in Boston or, or you know, uh, differences in, you know, uh, the wind in Chicago. It's about culture, just isolation by distance, right? And, and differences arising and giving rise to, to these differences, right? So uh, in those species, actually, um, females also grow up in certain environment and they, and they will prefer the local dialect to dialects that are from a different, different place, right? Um, and so... Uh, we do have some aspects of this individual variability. Now, what we can say is that when you, I've been focusing in my talk mostly on what I call, you know, aesthetic extremity, really, really an amazingly uh, extreme forms of animal beauty, right? And these arise mostly through unanimity, through less variation among individuals. And uh, so, I've been exploring in particular areas where there's less variation, but there's certainly lots of places where that's where the opposite is true. Okay, we, we only have time for one more question. So I'm gonna combine a few things people have asked about the publication of your book. We're certainly very impressed by you being chosen as one of the 10 best books by New York Times since they only choose five nonfiction, actually one of the five best nonfiction books and a finalist for Pulitzer and, and so on. But when we look at the list for most years, we see a lot of memoirs, biographies, uh, social issues, you know, somebody talking about um, some of the social strife we have with racial groups, or um, I'm sure there's going to be a lot coming out in the ne next few years about this election, for instance. Um, your book is so different from that. We're wondering how uh, Doubleday or other publishers reacted when you gave them the manuscript, or is it something that people approached you because of the lectures and so on you've given and the positive reception? Well, you know, um, you're right. It's a, it's a, it, uh, I'm, I'm totally grateful for the recognitions that, that it, the book has received. Um, and um, um, I actually uh, lost out in the Pulitzer Prize to another one of these Yaleys. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I know we're on St. Ronan and, and, and in New Haven, and yeah. yet he wrote a book basically about uh, the the uh, uh, African American investment in the creation of uh, of uh, sentencing laws that led to the incarceration state. So, right, exactly. So, I lost that to a book that was focused on on social issues, and and of course, uh, they're measuring all the ways in which a book can impact the culture. But yes, it is to do science is an up, you know, popular science is an uphill battle. Uh, people are afraid of science, right? And uh, and, and 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 a lot of it uh, uh, is poorly written, right? Uh, but when I submitted uh, my first uh, part of um, of my uh, um, uh, book that I wrote was uh, uh, the beginning of the duck sex chapter. It was a duck sex chapter, uh, which begins at a dinner table, a dinner party in New Haven where some uh, mom uh, of young kids asked me about make way for ducklings. And, and, uh, and it, was a real, it was a real event. And uh, my wife said, you didn't just ask my husband about duck sex, did you? And, uh, and the whole party burst into a discussion of this research that I've just presented, right? So uh, that was my first one. And I knew uh, you know, that it was a good representation of the way we could try to take science and make it uh, familiar, relevant to people's lives. Um, I love the hardcore science, getting into the nitty gritty of the arguments. Um, 
but uh, you know that's boring for most readers. So the challenge was to figure out how to how to get um, um, people in into the story behind story. People who don't care about birds or people who don't care about science but may like birds, right? Uh, and um, and I think beauty was a real selling point. And uh, they had faith in me. I also had some fantastic editors uh, that really, really worked with me to make my writing better. And uh, the way to have a good book is to listen to your editors. <laughs> uh, they saved me for myself and, and, and helped make this book so great. Well, we're certainly happy they did. I'm happy that your book did end up getting the recognition it deserves and getting the, the wide circulation that it has. So we are about out of time. So I am going to thank you so much. Well, thank you and very much. Uh, and thank you for, for persisting. It's great to uh, yeah. talk to you. Yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll consider this meeting. We, we can actually pick up from where we left off last March when the pandemic occurred. And goodbye to all the wise women. We're so happy you could join us. We are going to be meeting you know, our regular schedule every second and fourth Monday till the end of May and hoping, of course, we all get back to normal at some point. So get your vaccine when you can and we'll all hope we're well and, and survive another year. Stay safe. Bye-bye.